we should never settle for less again. One of your uh, missions at uh, Bio is getting uh, people to more appreciate uh, how critical this industry is to uh, the betterment of their lives. And uh, you uh, said uh, a lot of policymakers have unfortunately played uh, political football with our industry. Scientists aren't best at telling their stories. I'll give it to them. We were sitting ducks in many ways. <laughs> uh, explain how uh, you see as part of your mission, getting the word out, what an extraordinary industry this is. Mm -hmm. Well, scientists are single focused. That's what makes them such amazing scientists. They are focused on that problem that keeps them up at night and um, they're passionate about finding that, but they often um, forget to look up and figure out how the broader social context is, is impacting them. And so I really see our role at Bio as serving as that voice, that platform for them, um, and that bridge to the broader cultural conversation about what science can do. Science is the social justice issue of our age. It is so critically important because when I think about those communities I grew up with in Oakland, what they needed was access to clean water. They needed access to nutritious foods. Um, they needed clean air. And they needed to know that not only did they have access to health care, but once they got in the door of the doctor's office, they would actually have solutions on in the medicine cabinet that would help them. And you only get all of those things through applying biotechnology to all of those problems and working without relenting. So this is what's so critically important. We've seen this year with COVID that the rate of speed of developing a new COVID vaccine or COVID therapeutics has a disproportionate negative impact on communities of color because they're disproportionately impacted by the illness. So every week, we save in developing a new COVID vaccine is going to, by proportion, save more black and brown lives than it will others, although it's important for all. And so it's not to say that it's more important for one community than the other, but it's to say that it's not enough for us just to focus on access to health care, although that is critically important when we're talking about social justice. It's also important that we're talking about not slowing down, not giving up on that innovation engine, because that innovation engine is life-saving. Um, before we get to that, uh, can you... Uh, uh Give a, one of the things that uh, Bio did is uh, the tracker on uh, when the COVID-19 crisis came, uh, keeping track of therapeutics, uh, vaccines. Tell us a little bit about that. It's quite quite amazing the numbers involved. It's it's staggering. So early in the pandemic, Bio really brought all of our companies together to say what can we do, and we did lots of different work. We set up a Craigslist that basically platform that let companies m m mix and match um, resources. So one company had lab equipment, the other company had manufacturing capacity. How could we pool those resources to get to the end goal? That was very successful. From there, we built a COVID tracker, which globally tracked all of the research and development programs that are aimed at stopping or preventing COVID. And we still have that tracker going today. At our height in, the, in December, we had 838 research and development programs aimed at, co at COVID underway around the globe, many of them in, by bio member companies. And that's an amazing to see that rate of focus on, a, on one disease area within the space of 12 months. Many people have seen the COVID vaccine leading candidates talked about their clinical trials without realizing that there are actually 191 COVID vaccines in development. And while that might seem a bit more than we need sitting here today, I'll tell you three or four months ago when it was unclear if any of them would be successful, I was so happy that we had that many shots on goal because you can never predict with science what will actually cross that finish line. And so we needed as many different intellectual approaches to the problem as possible. Well, this uh, touches on what you uh, mentioned earlier, and that is the coronavirus collaboration initiative uh, that uh, Bio took uh, early uh, 2020. Uh, quickly go through that because that was absolutely unprecedented in enabling us to uh, where be where we are today, where we can see a vaccine in a matter of months rather than years. As you pointed out, the record before for a vaccine was, I think, mumps, and that took four years. 
Mm -hmm. You know, 11 months was a staggering increase in in that rate of speed. Um, You know, bio, among many others, played a key role, and Operation Warp Speed is to be lauded for um, the great foresight um, and focus that it placed on the efforts. But the industry as a whole also had lots of dedication um, and the ability to overlook competition and overlook um, how they could maybe not work together in the past to find new ways to collaborate. And so we really helped them on that collaboration front, um, particularly when it came to finding manufacturing capacity um, and making sure that we were sharing the scientific information as it as it was coming, which was fast and furious, um, to try to speed everyone's uh, progress along the route. It's uh, quite, quite something. And now we have the challenge today of vaccine distribution, uh, which has not gone as uh, smoothly. Uh, discuss that. Uh, f- rules such as when you have the vaccine, they want you to wait 15 minutes. Well, if you're going to have a problem, you'll, you'll have a problem. But that seems to slow down the distribution. Or some are saying that if uh, somebody doesn't show up for an appointment, just make sure somebody gets it. That helps uh, herd immunity. Give us your thoughts on the distribution and trying to uh, get that going with the kind of uh, warp speed, so to speak, that uh, led to the development of the vaccines. Well, let's be clear. There is no excuse for where we find ourselves today. Um, I, my mother-in-law lives in Germany and she had an appointment in the middle of December for when she was going to get her first, her first COVID vaccine. This is unbelievable that we would put this much attention into developing the vaccines and developing the therapeutics. And yet here we sit in January with the same therapeutics that were able to rescue the president sitting in in freezers unused um, and vaccines being disposed of at the end of the day because all of the content of the vial cannot be used because we cannot organize our response. It is astounding and it is heartbreaking to watch. This, there's no excuse for this. This is not rocket science. We've done max vac- mass vaccination programs before, and the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, have been saying for months what would be necessary for the states to be able to actually deliver the vaccine, get shots in arms, but they weren't given the resources. They weren't given um, the attention it deserved. So states are just now this week getting their hands on the resources they need. We've been speaking to governors across the country and you know, we heard from one governor who said, well, I have boxes of, of the vaccine delivered on pallets, and I have some resources to fund setting up clinics um, to deliver them, but I don't have any funding, for example, to set up and train people on the IT system needed to track all the doses of the vaccine, particularly important in a two-dose vaccine situation. You need to be able to track who has had the vaccine. But it's also critically important because lest we forget, these vaccines are authorized under emergency use authorization, which by definition means we don't yet know everything about um, what we'll see when the vaccine goes into the, the majority of the population. And so it's important to track all of that information so that we can fully understand it. Now, that being said, I don't want anyone to mistake my words. These vaccines have been under more scrutiny than any vaccines in history. Um, They've been in tens of thousands of people before they were ever released across the country. And we have the utmost confidence in in bio in the safety and efficacy of both the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccines and the ones to come. What lessons are we learning and how do we make sure uh, we just don't go back to the same old ways of everyone going their own narrow way? We have learned a tremendous amount. So when it comes to preventing the next pandemic, when it comes to even preventing the next iteration of COVID, because we know it's constantly mutating and evolving, we are incredibly prepared. The platforms that have shown success, for example, the the mRNA platform that has been used in both the Pfizer and Moderna vaccine are revolutionary in that they will com- they will forever change how we think about developing new vaccines. We also, I think, have have learned a lot about early warning systems and how seriously we need to take those early calls and the public health measures that work and don't work. But the things I think we've learned that are most impactful don't even have to do with infectious diseases. We have seen 
that the science is not our barrier, that often it's the bureaucracy, it's the miscommunication and misalignment, and it's the lack of resources and being focused on the solution and having a market for that solution at the end of the day that will deliver cures faster and better to patients. And that's what I hope we don't lose sight of. The Food and Drug Administration showed amazing flexibility in the context of COVID. They showed, you know, um, we had manufacturers saying, well, what normally takes me two to four weeks to get a response to FDA um, in a formal letter, now I'm able to get them on the phone and really able to work in real time towards adapting our plans to make sure they meet uh, FDA's demands. We, sh we should never settle for less again, but that's going to take resourcing the FDA to be able to have that high touch and rapid response approach. We've also seen, interestingly enough, um, that we need a new approach to clinical trials. It is telling that um, the two vaccines, Moderna and Pfizer, one used um, the more federalized um, clinical trial approach uh, to go through the process, and one did not. And the federal approach didn't necessarily save time. And so we need to look at our national clinical trial networks and ask us, ask ourselves, why are they not more easily mobilized for these massive public health concerns? And why is it so hard to get diverse patient populations through them? These are critically important questions that we are just starting to ask, but they'll be very important, not just for infectious diseases, but for every disease out there that's awaiting a cure. Thank you.